Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to this uh, ADVAC alumni webinar. I'm Philippe Duplot, I'm the director of ADVAC, and it's really a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar. We will be discussing an important topic that of the potential to move to one and only dose of HPV vaccine. This is particularly important because as you know, I mean, there has been a, a paucity of, uh, of vaccine and a short supply for the last few years at the time when we have a sustainable development goal objective of immunizing 90% of girls with HPV vaccine by 15 years of age. And as we speak, there are actually less than 120 countries that have partially or fully implemented HPV vaccination. And the overall coverage level as measured by WHO in 2020 is only 13%, far behind the other vaccine preventable diseases. There's also a high dropout rate for HPV. So let me first introduce our speaker, Margaret Stanley. Actually, she probably doesn't need much introduction. She's a long-standing faculty of uh, ADVAC, and she has been lecturing on HPV for many years. She's emeritus professor at Cambridge University, and she happens to be also the president of the Human Papillomavirus International Society. She's also a member of the SAGE Working Group and the JCVI Working Group on HPV, but what she will tell us is basically her own view, speaking on her own behalf and not on behalf of uh, WHO, SAGE, or JCVI. After the presentation of Margaret, where she will tell us on the, on the evidence and its limitation, uh, we will uh, hear briefly from uh, three discussants from Paul Bloom, who is the focal point for HPV at WHO headquarters. We'll also hear from uh, Andy Pollard, who is professor of immunology at Oxford. And last and not least, from Amy Kramer, who is at the National Cancer Institute, uh, part of NIH in the US and who has been uh, uh, um, really studying the epidemiology and the prevention of, uh, of HPV and related cancers. And she's also the principal investigator of the Costa Rica trial. All of you uh, participants will be able to ask questions. To ask questions, you will have to send emails to all participants on the chat box. And uh, when come your turn, then I will call upon you to, uh, to ask your question directly and we'll ask you then to be on uh, video mode so that everybody can uh, not only hear you, but also see you. So thank you everybody. And uh, without any more delay, let's hear from uh, Margaret. So please, Margaret. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Please go ahead. Uh, this will uh, cancel our sharing, okay? <coughs> Right. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk about this today. It's um, a topic very close to my heart. And so we're looking at the prospect of moving to a one and only dose schedule for the HPV vaccine. And I thought we'd perhaps rem remind you of the context in which this is all discussing. Um, HPV is a small DNA virus. It's a huge family, very common virus. And there are certainly more than 200, 220 known HP, HPVs. And it's distinguished by a strictly intraepithelial life cycle. This virus only undergoes productive viral infection within fully differentiated squamous epithelium. There's no viremia, it's an intraepithelial virus. Now about 30 to 40 of these, this uh, 200 types infect the internal squamous mucosae of men and women, and it, particularly in the genital tract that they've received attention. And they're basically two groups, those that cause warts, um, which don't turn into cancer, and those are for the genital tract, HPV 6 and 11, and there are 13 true cancer viruses. And these are the, the those that IHARP recognizes, and HPV oncogenic viruses cause more than 5% of all human cancers. So they're a significant burden. 16 is the 
um, most virulent, uh, followed by 18. Then these other types are really contributing at max 5%, usually about one or 2%. Now, the virus, fortunately, if you're thinking about um, its, the immune response to it and the prospect of vaccination, is a simple virus. This, uh, there are two coat proteins, L1 and L2. And if you look at this um, electron micrograph, cryomicrograph, these rosettes that stud the surface of the particle are L1 proteins, five L1 proteins forming these pumps. Pentabus. the and it's the L1 protein against which neutralizing antibody is raised. If you look at the crystal structure of L1 on this right-hand side, if you look at the primary structure, there are long stretches of um, amino acids which are homologous and shared between the cancer-causing types. And those are interspersed by regions of heterologous and, and non-shared. And if you look at the tertiary structure, then the um, uh, homologous sections are in these blue beta sheets, but the heterologous are in these surface loops. And it's in the surface loops that the neutralizing epitopes are present. So when you look at the pentama, so we're looking at five L1 molecules in this lower um, panel, A, then the blue and white are the um, uh, homologous amino acids, the red, are the loops protruding from the surface of the pentamer with the neutralizing epitopes. And this structure is important for the uh, immunogenicity of the HPV vaccines, which have been developed. Now, the vaccines, of course, consist of virus-like particles made only of the L1 protein. And virus-like particles are macromolecular assemblies of uh, pentamers. And they, this is a BLP. It's got no DNA, but importantly, um, in terms of uh, structure and size, it is pretty well identical to the um, infectious, the wild type virus. Now there are, uh, this is a slightly out of date slide because there are now four commercially available vaccines with the Chinese vaccine having been approved last year. But the first two vaccines to come onto the uh, commercial market to be licensed were the bivalent vaccine with 16 and 18 from GSK, Cervix, and the quadrivalent vaccine with 16, 18, and 6 and 11 from Merck. And the, both of these vaccines were licensed in Europe and the US in, in 2006, 2007. Now, they New kid on the block is Gardasil 9, which has um, seven oncogenic types and the two lowest types, 6 and 11. Now, in theory, if the epidemiology is right, then cervix and Gardasil should prevent 70% of cervix cancers, so 70% are caused by 16 and 18, and Gardasil 9 should um, prevent about 90%. Now, today we're talking very much about the dose schedule. And so this schedule at the bottom is a potted history of what's happened to date. So initially, these in the randomized controlled trials that led to licensure, uh, the vaccines were administered intramuscularly and they followed a prime prime boost schedule, which was absolutely standard for a subunit protein vaccine, which is what this is. And they were licensed initially for females nine to 26 years with this schedule. Now that schedule changed or the recommendations for it changed in 2014 when WHO SAGE recommended a prime prime boost schedule for those immunized when they were 15 years or older and a prime boost schedule of 06 or 012 months for the adolescent cohort of nine to 15 years. Now, the reason why this was done was for immunogenicity. And it was as a consequence of immunobridging trials in nine to 15 year olds versus 16 to 23 year olds. Because in the nine to 13 year olds after two vaccine doses, prime boost, when the boost came in um, six months or more, certainly not less than six months, 
then that antibody was as good as that generated after three doses in the 16 to 23 year olds in whom efficacy had been demonstrated. And the SAGE recommendations were that so this prime boost schedule could be put on if you were under 15, that you had to have a minimal interval. The three dose schedule was necessary for the over 15s. Uh, actually, the longer, the better. And the three dose schedule remained for immunocompromised individuals, including those known to be HIV infected. Despite this um, loosening of the requirements for um, dosage, the uh, coverage that we've achieved, as um, uh, Philippe has pointed out, has been less than stellar. So in 2019, uh, in a paper from Laia Bruni of, uh, from Barcelona, it was estimated of 15-year-old girls at target girls, only 13% had received the full two doses and 3% of boys. Now, since the, w, the WHO elimination call requires 90% of at-risk females to receive their full dose by 2030, this is not a significant effect. In fact, it's tragic. And remember, this is before COVID and the changes that COVID has brought. So why? Why is this? Well, HPV vaccines have faced pretty significant hurdles. First is cost. And it's not just the cost of the vaccine. It's the cost of implementation. It's the cost of administration. For most of the world requiring these vaccines, there was no adolescent platform. So an adolescent infrastructure had to be made. And that is costly. And each it, it, logistics were um, significant because it was hard to deliver three doses. It was hard to deliver two doses over the six month period if you didn't have a good infrastructure for adolescent immunization. And in fact, of, the, of those receiving HPV vaccines, 5% of them walk with their feet and don't come back for the second dose. But there's something more, and we forget it whilst we're talking about the uh, logistic problems. There are problems of perception. There's a long interval between exposure and disease. So there's a very distorted perception of risk over time. If you're immunizing a girl at 10, for a disease which will manifest itself at 40, then the, the um, perception of why you're doing this is distorted. And also <clears throat> it has a bad press because it's a vaccine against a sexually transmitted infection given to adolescent girls. So there are lots of strikes against HPV vaccines. We have to think imaginatively of dealing with them. One of them is looking at alternative dosage schedules and asking the question, would one dose be sufficient? Would it generate protection? And that has been um, poo-pooed by many people, but there are a number of trials which give us evidence now that one dose probably is sufficient for protection. And these are the trials that I'm going to discuss, apart from the Thailand impact trial, for which um, I haven't got permission to show you the data. But we'll start, these are the trials for which at this moment, we have data on one dose um, HPV vaccines in terms of efficacy and immunogenicity or immunogenicity only, and from time and effectiveness and impact. So let's start first with looking at the Costa, vaccine, the Costa Rica vaccine trial. Now, this was uh, the trial that flagged up, first of all, the possibility that one dose might actually be effective. And Amy Kramer and colleagues in, 19, in 2011 published a paper uh, looking at a, a post hoc analysis of the randomized control trial for the Costa Rica vaccine trial, in which um, a significant proportion of women who'd been enrolled in this randomized control trial 
to show efficacy for HPV vaccines on a three dose schedule had in fact received less than two doses, than three doses. Uh, so they hadn't completed the full series, but they were followed up and they were followed up rigorously by uh, Amy and her colleagues. And as you can see quite clearly, didn't matter whether you got three, two or one dose, you were protected against persistent infection with HPV 16 or 18 for the 36 months of follow-up. Now, what is persistent infection and why was it a valid outcome? Persistent infection is the detection of the same type of HPV, HPV DNA on two consecutive occasions, um, at least six months apart. If I remember correctly for the uh, Costa Rica vaccine trial, this was at least 10 months apart. And the persistent infection as defined by that is a surrogate for the development of the obligate precursor to cervical cancer, CIN3. So that is why it is a, an, an accepted outcome to show vaccine efficacy. Now, this small trial, post hoc analysis, has been followed now for at least 11 years. And this is the latest publication from Amy and her colleagues. And this is 11 years, and you can see three, two, or one, the efficacy against persistent infection remains the same. So one dose is as good as three or two. Now it's important to, to recognize that these are small numbers, but it's a trial which has been rigorously um, controlled. Um, and the methodologies, the assay methodologies, the laboratory methodologies, and I've got a strong feelings about this, are again consistent and done in the same laboratories. That's extremely important for readout. If you look at antibody, persistent protection from one, two, or three is accompanied by persistent antibody. Now this shows you one important fact, antibody concentrations with one dose are always inferior to those achieved by two or three, but the antibody concentrations are stable. This plateau level going out over 11 years is a measure of the rate of antibody decay. And you can see antibody is not decaying over this 11 years. So, so pr protection, prevention of persistent infection is accompanied by sustained serum antibody, both binding and neutralizing. So that's the Costa Rica vaccine trial. And you could argue that, well, it's a post hoc analysis, so there must be bias, and that uh, the numbers are small, but the, it is consistent, highly consistent, and it's from well-controlled methodologies, careful laboratory assays, you can believe the data. Now, the second trial, is um, the IARC India trial looking at efficacy and immunogenicity. And this again is an observational study. It's not a randomized control, control trial, but it started as a randomized control trial. And I'm grateful to the lead investigator, Partha Basu, for allowing me to show you some of his slides. So this trial was initially planned to look at the two versus three dose. Um, HPV vaccine schedule. It was a, designed as a multicentric randomized control trial. And those who were eligible to be recruited had to be unmarried, unvaccinated girls between 10 and 18 years of age. India is a highly conservative society. There is no question of being able to take a vaginal or cervical sample in an unmarried girl. <clears throat> so the uh, Girls were um, recruited unmarried, but to determine their infection or non-infection, we it was wait, decided to wait until they were married when they came back and then were eligible for vaginal and cervical sampling. Now the plan was to recruit 10,000 girls and they started off with nine sites participating in 2009. And then in 2010, for reasons totally unconnected with this trial, the government of India stopped all 
HPV vaccination in all trials. The eight, almost 18,000 girls were already recruited and vaccinated. So the girls couldn't continue with their vaccine program, but they could be followed up. And serendipitously, when the trial was stopped, they were four groups. There were those who'd done the full three dose, the prime, prime boost. There were those who'd done two doses, zero, uh, six prime boost. And there were those who had an interrupted schedule that had two doses and zero and two. And there was a significant number who'd ha only had one dose. And they have all been followed up and followed up now for 11 years. And these are the latest data that I've been able to access. So when we look at this is the dosage here, the number of subjects are all pretty well comparable. And you've got to remember, these are women who now have married or have their first baby and therefore have been eligible for sampling and determination of HPV DNA status. The outcome measurement is percent persistent 1618 HPV infection in the dose categories compared to a control, which is an age matched um, married vaccinated subjects who were recruited, uh, sorry, uh, the controls are unvaccinated and age matched, and they're age matched to the vaccinated subjects. And these unvaccinated groups were recruited as controls. And persistent infection, I've discussed before, and these are the factors which have been adjusted for vaccine efficacy. But the take home message is simple. Whether you've got three, two or one, you were protected equally against persistent infection with HPV 16, 18. And I remind you that persistent infection is the surrogate for the obligate precursor to cervical cancer, CIN3. So this, I think, is, is very persuasive evidence, but it, again, it is not a randomized control trial. It's an observational study. But you could argue that there is no, that the randomization is actually not lost because the trial was stopped. It was where you were in the vaccine process was actually entirely by chance. And this, these are the data. Now, the interesting thing that we're looking at here is that India is a low HPV prevalence community. So um, maybe we just haven't got enough HPV infection around, but it's very strong evidence, I think, that one dose works. Now we look at the randomized control trial that we have looking at efficacy. This is the Kenshi trial from Kenya. And it was its data have only recently, interim data have only recently been presented. So again, I must thank the investigators and principal investigators, Ruan and uh, Barnabas and Nelly Mugo and all the Ketchi investigators for allowing me to sh show you these slides. So the Kenshi trial is the efficacy of single dose HPV vaccination among young African women. And this is the study design. Uh, it's three centers in Kenya. It's a randomized control trial. And the subjects are young women aged 15 to 20 years. They must have less than uh, five lifetime partners. They're HIV negative. They've not been previously vaccinated. They are pregnant and a, a, a classic exclusions. And they had to be resident. And they were randomized into three groups. They either got the non-avalent, the nine-valent vaccine, the two-valent vaccine, or a control meningococcal vaccine. The trial is designed to go on for 36 months. And at the end of 36 months, they cross over and have the meningococcal vaccine if they've had HPV. And the meningococcal vaccines receive, it will receive the HPV vaccine. Now, these, these are the interim results which, which were presented at the Papillomavirus meeting uh, in um, November last year and are um, out in a preprint and have been accepted for publication in the New England Journal of Medicine Evidence. And this is just looking at 16 and 18 and comparing the nine valent, two valent 
with the meningococcal vaccine group. You can see the numbers are equivalent. Uh, the percent persistent infection in these two groups, uh, actually the it's not percent, it's the number of cases, there were one, one and 36. The incidence per 100 person years, 0 0.17 for the two, if you've been vaccinated, 6.83 if you haven't been vaccinated for the HPV vaccine, which translates into a vaccine efficacy of 97.5. So this is at 18 months after one dose of the HPV vaccine. It's the modified intention to treat. The women were HPV 16, 18 negative at enrollment, and that's external genitals, so it's perianal, um, vulval and, <coughs> and cervical swabs at enrollment and at month three. And they had to be HPV antibody negative at, at enrollment. These, I think, are quite stunning results. Now, when you look at the nine valent vaccine for efficacy against the additional types, again, these are cases of persistent HPV of any of these types. There are four in the nine valent vaccinated group and 29 in the not meningococcal vaccinated group with an incidence of per 100 person years of one for nine valent vaccine, 9.4 for the, the unvaccinated group and a vaccine efficacy of 88.9. So you can, the conclusions from this are that in this trial, adolescent girls and young women were protected very effectively from HPV infection over the first 18 months post-vaccination. The vaccine efficacy for the 16-18 group was 97%, and that's in keeping with the licensure trials for um, both two-valent and nine-valent vaccine for three doses. The nine valent high risk vaccine type, the HPV incidence is very high. And this again is a really important fact for these this particular trial. So the prevalence of infection with these high risk types is uh, around about nine per hundred women years. Which, and that's a third higher than previous vaccine trials. Now we're looking here at East Africa, the cervical cancer um, capital of the world. And so you're looking at a very high incidence, high prevalence um, community. And my personal statement, and people have heard me say this, if one dose protects in East Africa, it'll protect anywhere. And so I think this is a really important trial. Furthermore, it's rigorous design, it's high fidelity to the protocol, and a very high retention, I'm not showing you those data, and, a, and again, a clear ascertainment of outcomes. Now, um, the final trial for which I'm going to show you some data is an immunobridging immunogenicity trial in um, Tanzania. And I must um, uh, be totally transparent, I am on the trial steering committee for this trial is looking at the two-valent and nine-valent vaccine, and it's looking in nine to 14-year-old females, and it's immunobridging. It's a randomized control trial, and there are three dose groups. So we've rec they've recruited 930 girls, nine to 14 years old, and they're randomized to one, two, or three doses of two-valent or nine-valent HPV. And there were two objectives to demonstrate non inferiority of 1618 antibody responses after one dose compared to two or three at month 24. To look at the non inferiority of 1618 geometric mean concentrations comparing one dose and Doris with the historical efficacy cohorts that have had one dose. So that's immunobridging to CVT, to India IARC, and to Kenshi. And the uh, results at 24 months, their seroconversion is excellent. And the seropositivity is greater than 97.5% uh, for all doses of both vaccines. 
the antibody levels by dose, by vaccine and the kinetics over time are quite absolutely similar to those in other HPV vaccine studies. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And there's no difference in antibody affinity. That's the strength of binding of the total antibodies produced in the immune response. Um, so that is the strength of the antibody antigen uh, binding for all the antibodies you've generated against that specific um, antigen. And there's no difference between the dose groups of vaccines. Basically, that tells you that the antibody quality is the same whether you've got one, two, or three doses, whether you've got a 2V or a 9V. And importantly, the immunobridging showed that the one-dose responses were non-inferior in Doris compared to those in Kenshi, IARC, and CDT, where we've shown one-dose efficacy. And finally, um, a, a, not a trial, but a, a, a population cohort analysis. And this is from Australia. Now, remember, Australia started vaccinating very early, 2007, had very high vaccine coverage consistently, have an excellent screening program and an excellent vaccine register. So they can relate um, who's been vaccinated to who develops cervical abnormalities. And this is looking at the, uh, co the national screening cohort, 2007 to 2014 in women born in 1992 or earlier. And so, my apologies, sorry, my apologies. The um, abnormality is CIN3 or adenocarcinoma in situ. So that, that's, this is what your screening has detected. Whether you've got zero doses, one, two, or three, the number of women in each group and the number of cervical abnormalities and the rate per thousand women years and the hazard ratio the hazard ratio of the unvaccinated, of course, is one is the reference. And essentially you can see that whether you go one, two or three, and did not impact on diagnosis of CIN3, equivalent protection against CIN3 in this population. Now, one of the arguments and criticisms about this study and a, a companion study from Denmark, which shows exactly the same thing, is that in both of these communities, you've had very high population coverage and really tremendous herd protection. So are we looking at uh, the result of herd protection or is this a genuine uh, reflection of uh, one dose effect, uh, effectiveness? Well, Julia Brotherton and colleagues um, did tremendous uh, uh, statistical analyses to exclude the herd protection and uh, are reasonably confident that this is a reflection of dose protection, not herd protection. So that's the trial data, which I think is reasonably supportive. The criticism would be we only have one randomized control trial showing efficacy, and that is of a short duration of 18 months. But the long-term 11-year trials from CVT and um, uh, India IARC, I think, are very persuasive. And I want to look now at the antibody question, because this is always one which is raised. Because whatever trial you look at, the antibody concentrations achieved after one dose, this is the CVT trial, and it's over a four-year period, and the purple line is one dose. They are inferior to two, whether it's prime boost or um, prime uh, boosted two months or three doses. But the curves are the same. So you get this peak, decline, plateau. And as I said to you, the plateau is the rate of antibody decay. And at least over this four year period, there is no evidence of antibody decay. And this is the um, cutoff point for the laboratory. And this is the um, natural antibody level. 
So this is the CBT trial for four years, now seven years. And importantly, here we're looking at avidity um, in addition to the um, persistence of antibody. And remember, as I said to you, avidity is a measure of antibody affinity of the, all the antibodies generated. Because when, when you vaccinate, you're generating a polyclonal response. And normally you would expect some to be low affinity, some to be high affinity. But with the VLP, interestingly, you seem to have a polyclonal response, which is almost all high affinity antibody. And you see this in the avidity data. And now looking at Doris, and why I want to show you Doris is Doris, is, it's argued, is a um, only a short term. You're only looking at 24 uh, months for antibody persistence in this um, high prevalence, high risk area of East Africa uh, with, with a nine valent vaccine, for example. Um, so why, uh, you know, why have you got confidence that this is going to continue? Well, I think the kinetics tell you that this is actually, you could put this onto, uh, onto the CVT trial data and it would, it would fit completely. You've got the peak decline in antibody uh, with the, then the persistence and virtually no loss of antibody concentration as time goes on. Now, this is actually a, a reflection of the two arms of memory. So what you're looking at here are the population of plasma cells, which is generated after your first immunization. And it, these plasma cells are composed of those that make antibody and die quickly, and those which move to the bone marrow where they stay and secrete antibody over time. In mice, these long-lived plasma cells live for the lifetime of the mouse, and there's increasing evidence that they do so also in humans. So when you're looking at this stable plateau, you're probably looking at the long-term persistence of antibody. And it's true for both the um, uh, 16 and 18, and was true also for the other anti. And similarly from Doris, you have the avidity index. So I, these data are <coughs> very persuasive, very persuasive indeed. And uh, particularly the Kenshi data, I think is a game changer and certainly um, gives tremendous confidence that one dose will prevent infection, persistent infection, induce sterilizing immunity in a high prevalence, high risk society. Now, why is it so, why is the HPV vaccine so good at inducing long-term antibody? Well, antibody responses are quite different after natural infection and after vaccination. Basically, after vaccination, everybody seroconverts, you've got high antibody concentrations, long-lived antibody, fidity index is high, but there's no immune correlate. So you get protection, even when antibody levels are extremely low. And natural infection, importantly, the antibody quality in natural infection is very, very variable. Now, why is, why is the vaccine so good? Well, it's all about the VLP. The um, anti antigen structure is critical to immunogenicity. The VLP is the right size. It moves across endothelia very efficiently. But the GM geometry of the VLP is the crucial factor. It's a multivalent protein antigen. We have 360 copies of L1 assembled as these pentamers. Remember that picture I showed you, the pentamer, with all those loops protruding from the stop. That's what you're looking at, these 360 copies. And the neutralizing epitopes on those loops are spaced at the optimal distance which is eight to 10 nanometers across the pentamers. Now that cross links the B cell receptor very efficiently. 
and cross-linking and clustering are attributes which we know are crucial for B-cell activation and the induction of high affinity, high affinity antibody. This first encounter of the VLP and the B-cell receptor is critical because the strength of that interaction and, this, and the signaling which it produces sets up all the events which are happening downstream of the long-term effectiveness of the antibody response. And it induces remarkably effective memory. Now you could say to me, well, that's all well and good, Dr. Stanley, but if this VLP, if this structure is so important, why is natural infection not doing it? Well, that's probably all about the context, the route of immunization. Because in natural infection, you have it, virus infects without a strong inflammatory response. It's actually an, a non-inflammatory mechanism which allows it to access the keratinocyte. That's completely different to the VLP vaccine, which is going, you're delivering intramuscularly, you've got an, an adjuvant, you've got a, a pro-inflammatory response, strong production of, cytok of the right cytokines and chemokines to give the environment which is going to drive the immune response. And so you get in, in robust memory. So it, the effectiveness of the HPV vaccines is about the antigen which we're using, the VLP, but also the biology of this virus because it's intraepithelial a strong systemic response is highly effective. So where are we going next? Well, we, I've talked about the trials for which we have data, but there are other trials um, on, that are uh, in progress. Uh, the HANS trial in Gambia, looking at girls at four to eight and nine to 14. The pivotal randomized control trial, which is coming from the NCI, a SCUDO trial in Costa Rica, in which there are large numbers of um, subjects randomized to one or two doses of, of bivalent or nine valent vaccine, which will report in a couple of years' time. And the um, HOPE study in South Africa, which is looking at a crucial question about HIV seroconversion in previously HPV immunized girls. And of course, the Primavera trial, which is starting in Costa Rica, which is a head to head for the bivalent quadrivalent vaccine. So what else should we be looking at? Well, we haven't got formal evidence for one dose for boys, but that can, can be inferred from the evidence we have from the immunobridging for two doses for boys. We don't know about Mondo's efficacy in older age groups. And quite crucially, it's the immunocompromised. HIV is the elephant in the room and we need to devote more attention to it. Well, I'll stop there because I hope I've convinced you that the, there is good evidence for one dose. There are questions to be asked, but I think it, we can proceed with confidence. But, I, this is one fact I really have to say. It doesn't matter how many doses you're delivering if you don't get the needle in the arm. Coverage is absolutely crucial. One dose is removing significant hurdles, but getting 80 to 90% coverage is absolutely required for disease elimination. So we're going to have to put our minds to that strongly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. This was a, a really a fabulous presentation. You covered so much ground uh, that, that that's really amazing. I, I noticed you used several times the word very persuasive uh, during your, your speech. And I think indeed that uh, all the, uh, the set of data that you did show us is, is very persuasive, at least very much to me. I was particularly struck that, that uh, for once, we have data from all around the world data for basically all vaccines or most vaccines and uh, also we have data in very different settings and risk of infection which uh, adds to the persuasion as far as i'm concerned 
Let me now, before we move to question, and we already have one, uh, one question, I'll turn to the, the person asking later on, but I, I would like first to hear a bit from our discussant. And perhaps uh, I, I will not go in the order by which they are listed in the, uh, in the introductory slide, but I will first ask uh, Andy Pollard uh, to come up and, uh, and give his, uh, his remarks and, uh, and comments. Uh, considering that you finish your, your speech with uh, talking uh, about uh, immunology. And I also know, Andy, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you are pressed by time. So you are with us only for uh, only a few more minutes. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. It, it's, it's actually very difficult to follow Margaret because she said everything um, and uh, uh, so eloquently as always. Um, I think um, that the one other thing that strikes me is that um, we've, we've got, a, as you were saying, uh, uh, Philippe, a lot of um, data that's presented here from, from around the world, and actually rather more than we had when we made the first decisions um, about using um, these vaccines um, more than a decade ago. And I think that, that sort of build-up of, uh, of knowledge about the persistence of protection, protection across different age groups and, and different geographies, um, provides, um, uh, I think, a lot of confidence in, in this route in moving forwards. Uh, some people say we, sh we should wait longer because there's going to be more evidence, and clearly there will be more information that emerges um, over time. Um, and even 10 years from now, there'll be new information. Um, but we've got, as Margaret, I think, very um, lucidly showed, a body of, of evidence here that gives us confidence. And beyond that, we understand the biology. Uh, to the extent that um, as you look at the decay curve of, of antibody, um, as we see with most B cell responses, um, in fact all B cell responses, most of the decay happens um, in the first six to eight months, and then there's a much slower decline or, or a plateau. And here we're seeing you know, that beautifully shown with an HPV vaccine, that that is the case. And when you get out to two years and there's been no change at all over that period, then you would not anticipate that there will be a sudden drop off. And of course, we actually have data um, out to 11 years um, with the, uh, the Indian data, showing that there's very good persistence over a uh, protection over that period of time. So it's just not plausible that there would be a sudden drop off um, at some point next year or the year after. So we're not going to suddenly have new information from the ongoing studies and that will change things radically if we were to wait one or two more years. So I, I think for me, we've got a very strong body of evidence, very um, uh, convincing data from these different geographies. And now uh, this uh, uh, sort of biological view that we can get by combining both uh, the um, effectiveness data, the efficacy data from the RCTs um, and the antibody data that gives us a package uh, that brings this all together. Um, here in the UK, we're, we're also um, debating this issue. Uh, where we've reached is we're now, at, uh, at, there's an interim statement from JCBI um, on the use of one dose, and that's out for consultation at the moment. There isn't a final decision here about um, the direction of travel, but uh, that uh, consultation will be reviewed fairly soon to make, a, make that final um, uh, decision. And so I'll stop there and, and uh, I, I can hang on for a few more minutes. Thank you very much, Andy. And indeed, if you can uh, hang around for a few more minutes and if there are uh, immunological related questions, uh, I, I would turn them to you. Uh, let's now hear from Paul Bloom from WHO. Please, Paul. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you also for pronouncing my name in the proper Dutch way, which not everyone can do, but you as a former colleague definitely can. Um, and really a pleasure, you know, following uh, Margaret. Thank you for a, a splendid presentation and, and also Andrew's words. Um, I think, um, you know, Andrew used the word very eloquently. So yes, Margaret eloquently explained many things, including the programmatic challenges that we have seen. Um, you know, many of you are aware of this, but we've had over the last, uh, you know, decade and a half, we've had 
for safety concerns about these vaccines, which are now going more into the background and countries, um, you know, now feel more, uh, have more trust in the vaccine and are introducing. Um, they had questions about why girls needed to be vaccinated so early. There were questions among others by Gavi about can the low-income countries actually do a three-dose schedule and they were required to do demonstration programs at small scale for quite some years before they were allowed to go national. I think we've overcome all that. We realize the vaccine is expensive but actually the cost of the vaccination particularly to the to the lower income countries is enormous and so um, you know the result of all this has been that um, many countries have not yet, not yet introduced the ones that have are also often ones with quite challenging uh, health infrastructure with systems that will have more challenges delivering uh, these vaccines than some of the countries that have already introduced, which are of course mostly high income and upper middle income countries. And then we have this low coverage. So Margaret showed the 13%. Um, now, the 13%, we have to you know, put that in a certain perspective. That is indeed the global coverage figure. That doesn't mean how well a program in a country is performing. It's everyone combined. Uh, who are we reaching among all the girls, say, 10 to 14? Um, and that is 13%, which is still low, and it shows us how much we have to travel. But I think what's happening in many of these programs is, is as concerning. Um, they reach coverages anywhere between 5% in some of countries in Europe um, to 40% in higher income countries that have really uh, worked very hard to get high coverage with the final dose. Um, and yes, some countries do reach high coverages, but what they all, many countries have in common is huge dropout. So we see an average dropout of, if I'm not mistaken, 14%, and it ranges from 1% or 2% in the best performing countries to 50% in others. So still a huge challenge getting that second dose in. So, you know, we, we, we all have been concerned about these factors as well, these programmatic factors, and hence, hence the appeal, of course, of the, of the one dose. We looked at this in 2019, and then the... The, the issue of supply was really one of the pressing issues. We asked SAGE, given supply constraints, what can you tell us? And do look at the one dose evidence. At the time, the evidence was considered interesting, but insufficient. And so we asked again now in 2021, last year, the, the SAGE working group to start looking at this, still having supply somewhat in, in our background, but now really looking at is the scientific evidence there to potentially move to a permissive one dose? Because we do have a special one dose. Those of you who have read the, the advice that SAGE has given, it says one or two doses. It's permissive because people didn't expect to see this very high efficacy coming from the one trial to confirm what we had seen. And we did think that to move to a universal one dose is still too early. We're waiting for this big Escudo trial that, ha that will show whether one uh, dose is definitively, if you want, non-inferior to two doses. We may not know that exactly, but we know how comparable and compelling the evidence came out based on the current data already. And so I think that gave uh, SAGE the confidence uh, to really um, you know, move to a permissive one dose, so you can consider the one dose. At WHO, we did have uh, at first really in mind that we could use this to reach these many girls in what we called multi-age cohort catch-up strategies. These are girls at the older range of the eligibility spectrum who would, uh, if they didn't get a final catch-up dose or doses, would not receive the vaccine ever. 
and this is the current situation many girls in uh, you know Mozambique Tanzania Zambia they're waiting for a supply to be available to get this ketchup and some of them are turning 15 they will, won't uh, no longer be eligible for uh, for HPV vaccination and so um, this was indeed our original target to see girls that otherwise would have had zero doses could use um, the fact that one dose gives already a very strong protection now that protection turns out so high that it's uh, hard to distinguish uh, whether it's different from a two dose protection and that is quite tremendous news in the meantime the supply situation has changed and this is mainly due to COVID in a strange way. We have uh, actually had such a drop in coverage all over the globe that uh, we all consumed less doses of, of HPV and therefore more is available. And so now the market actually is starting to be unconstrained, which is good news of course, riding on, on a wave of bad news. Um, and so countries can now, there are sufficient countries for other, uh, in new countries to introduce. Um, but of course, um, you know, we, we now have this, this new evidence and, and, and the SAGE has told us you can consider do, using this not only in multi-age cohorts, but also in routine cohorts. Um, so that is, very fresh we this was new information of course uh, in the review of uh, a week and a half ago um so you all know the the, the who processes uh, sage is an advisory body so this is clearly advice to who we are now going to consider that advice and we will work towards the who position on hpv vaccine um, we foresee to kind of uh, you know update that position over the coming month and by the end of this year come out with an updated position we also want to move into a, 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 a further series of let's say consultation with stakeholders to address the challenges that we still have, what are the further research needs? And, you know, Margaret alluded to some of them, HIV positive, other groups, um, then the girls uh, that we need to address and how can we make sure that research is really happening. Um, we need to work, of course, there will be market implications, uh, there will be regulatory implications because the evidence that we now have is for a series of vaccines and some of the new vaccines coming to the market do not yet have this um, this information, this this efficacy uh, uh, data uh, or or evidence that 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 three of the current vaccines will have. So there's there's some more work to do, but clearly this is uh, in in any case going to be an off-label uh, recommendation, which means Nitex. Um, are invited to look at this and have to make their own judgment. We heard from Andy how how the JCVI has started to do that and they as well have are moving into stakeholder consultation. So I think it will be a, a very interesting process and it, it will be very important for all to be involved and to to help us all shape or of how we can get to robust resilient programs because we were hit by COVID and the one vaccine that has been affected most in terms of drop in coverage has been HPV. And it was already the vaccine with, you know, if you, if you permit me, sometimes the most lousy coverages of any vaccine that countries have in their portfolio. So we do have to move to these high coverages. We do have an expectation of 90% for elimination. And that should have everyone thinking of how can we reach there with the current tools at hand. And an efficacious vaccine is one thing, an efficacious uh, schedule is the next thing. And combining that with your coverage is what finally will give the protection and the cases of cancer averted, not only one of the three. So um, I, I look forward to a, a really a good discussion here, but also a good consultation over the coming months with, with many of the, of the partners that, that may be in the room uh, here with us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let me now call upon Amy to uh, um, provide her comments.
And uh, I see we have a lot of questions, some are quite provocative, and uh, I'll turn to these first after uh, hearing from Meme. And we have also quite a few uh, questions, sorry, uh, asking about uh, uh, age-specific uh, issues, and as well as uh, making some comments about the, the cost-effectiveness of, uh, of the programs. So uh, let's hear first from Eme. Eme. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, so much has already been said, so I'm gonna keep my comments short. Um, some of the key points that I think about quite a bit are the fact that you know, 16 years after these vaccines have been proven to be safe and efficacious and to be licensed globally, 16 years, we have uptake under 20% globally. That means 80% of target age girls are not getting this vaccine that is proven to work. And it's correlated that people not getting vaccination are also the ones with the highest risk of cervical cancer. So to me at this point, this is absolutely unacceptable. And so a lot of the conversation is about, you know, how does one compare to two, the antibodies are lower, but the protection is high enough. But what has become so crystal clear with all the existing evidence is how much better, how much benefit there is in one compared to nothing. So I think these new um, recommendations that are on the table from WHO and, G and, and the UK are a tremendous public health opportunity that makes me so excited um, because I think, you know, coming down to one dose will make this achievable for so many more countries and, you know, for vaccine introductions, for better uptake among countries that have already introduced. Um, is there still more work to be done? Of course there is. As Paul was saying, you know, we would like to know how does one compare to two? Is it less efficacious? If it is, how much? And if it is less efficacious, that's probably okay because if we can offset that with higher uptake, we can still probably avert more cervical cancers. I've, you know, I've spoken a lot about cervical cancer because when we think globally about HPV-associated cancers, we know that about 85% about of those are, due, you know, are at the cervix. Of course, HPV does cause cancer at other anatomic sites. And in some countries like the United States, we have similar numbers of cervical cancers to say, for example, oropharynx cancers. That's because cervical cancer screening has done a really good job of pulling down our cervical cancer numbers. Um, so we do still have additional questions about how will um, one dose work at non-cervical sites? How will one dose work in boys? And so there is definitely more work to be done. Um, and I think that the right decisions that were made at this time, because I think for the moment with HPV vaccine shortages abating, with um, availability of HPV vaccine doses, we really have, again, this tremendous public health opportunity. We have to pull down the rates of cervical cancer globally. And so our focus should be on these girls that's where the evidence was generated and getting them vaccinated. And I think over the next several years, as we have um, scale up from the existing manufacturers, as we have new vaccines coming online, albeit not with one dose data. So that's also a current gap in our knowledge right now. Um, as you know, and maybe less dosing needed for older women as well. I just think there's going to be tremendous opportunities for controlling um, cervical cancer and hopefully all HPV associated cancers. So I think this is going to be a really important decade for prevention of HPV driven cancers with really great public health opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And uh, I, I find the, the common uh, uh, factor between our three discussants is that they are cautiously optimistic. Um, and um, I, um, I, I guess I'm impatient also that, that, that we have a bit more definitive uh, data out there. Um, I will ask actually our three discussants, uh, they're still there uh, to come all on video as well as, uh, as Margaret, so we can uh, see all of you on the, on the screen. And I will now turn to our participants. Uh, I will start uh, asking uh, Emmanuel Mogisha to ask uh, his question directly. So Emmanuel, please come on video and uh, ask your question directly. I hope that our technician can move uh, six vignettes uh, all together on the, the main screen so that we see uh, Andy Pollard in, in big as well and, uh, and Emmanuel and the next um, 
um, colleagues asking questions. Yeah. So, Emmanuel? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, my video uh, can't get on. Uh, so, okay. my, yeah, it's a very simple question, but thanks again, uh, Professor Stanley, for that uh, presentation. And uh, definitely, always uh, good to hear from you. I, I was asking, I mean, you in your presentation, you actually indicated that the the uh, the HPV infection actually does not uh, induce, uh, it actually induces very low antibody response. But I was wondering, of course, why then they do not benefit from the vaccine because actually ideally they don't benefit. But I mean, you actually stress the fact that they actually induce a very low uh, immune response. Uh, so why can they get uh, benefit from the vaccine? And again, the second one, I mean, just very quickly is that uh, since now we are getting uh, uh, a long duration of protection. So it looks like then we could actually begin with the area ages instead of waiting for 10 years. Could we now move to area ages, three, two, one, or something like that, because that's easier to get them than when they're at school already. Thank you. Well, can okay. I just answer the first uh, bit of please, your question? Please, Margaret. If you've been previously infected um, and you've made an antibody response, or even if you haven't, there's no evidence that you've made an antibody response, but you're DNA negative, you definitely benefit from vaccination. In fact, um, there's some very nice data from Denise Galloway that uh, such individuals actually have memory. And when they see the um, antigen in, via the, the vaccine route of immunization, they make an excellent recall response. They have good antibody. And in the trials, um, they were taken out as special groups and they benefit. They showed as much protection as um, uh, individuals who had no evidence of previous infection. So if you've been previously infected, you benefit from vaccination. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Anybody would like to, to add? Amy? Um, yeah, we see the same thing in our data in terms of looking at protection. If we stratify by those who have evidence of um, natural immunity or not, we see that their protection against the virus is the same. And that makes sense because these localized viruses do not induce systemic immunity and the antibody response is quite weak. And, and you know, and only a, like half of the people who have natural infection actually have an immune response. So it does make sense, you know, and then we see these vaccine induced responses that are an order of magnitude higher than natural immunity. So it makes sense that the vaccination would still be very beneficial. Um, and if you do look early on in antibody patterns, it does look like a little different between the two groups, those who are naturally infected versus totally naive. Um, but after about six or 12 months, everything kind of like looks the same after that. So the message is in people who have had HPV infections previously or not, the vaccine still works great for both groups and should be applied. Thank you. Anybody would like to add to this uh, answer or no? So yeah, let's well, maybe, to maybe to say oh, yeah, a, li a, a little bit. So I'm, I, I agree. I saw that uh, there was, oh, maybe I'm on another question. No, let's leave it on this. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So uh, the, the other part of, uh, of uh, Emmanuel's question had to do with the age uh, of vaccination. So perhaps, uh, Andy, would you like to take that one on? Um, well, I, I think uh, others are more expert on this uh, than me, but uh, I mean, I think one important point um, um, that we could perhaps direct at Margaret is um, the, the antibody induction by age, and there tend to be lower antibody levels in the older age groups. Um, and much of the data we've been looking at are actually in, in those over 15 and higher antibody levels in the under 15s, which I think gives us more confidence in the immune responses um, in that age group. Um, and I think it might be also worth, because it boys comes up here as well. So when we're thinking about immune responses, the boys are certainly at least as good in their immune responses as girls and probably a bit better. So when you put all of those factors together, I think that's where the confidence is um, around use of, of single dose, because we can bridge from the older um, girls and young women to the younger girls and to the boys, just as we did previously with the original vaccine trials with three doses and, and then the date with two doses. But perhaps Margaret is better um, to, to comment on that than me. 
Well, there's no question that the younger you go, the better your antibody response, um, at least to the HPV vaccine and the Hep B vaccine. There's one trial with the bivalent vaccine, which is in the literature, which was in, um, I think it was five to six year olds or four to six year olds in Central America. Uh, and their, um, their antibody response was phenomenal. It was better than the antibody response in 10 year olds and the antibody response in 10 year olds is better than 16 year olds and we could go on. So in terms of generating an antibody response, that young age group, and you know more about babies than I do, but uh, I think certainly down to the sort of um, 18 months, two years age, you're going to get a fantastic response. It's all about, um, do, do we have the confidence that this is going to be protecting us for 30, 40 years? I have, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that public health um, policy makers would be quite as committed. Well, I, I think that there is an important issue there, Margaret, with the very young age groups like the under twos or perhaps even the under fives, but certainly with the under twos, because the bone marrow niches you were talking about um, are not the same in that age group. And so I think we would really need to have some good persistence data over more than a few years um, to have confidence in vaccinating at 18 months of age, for example. I mean, the, the initial responses are good, but what one would not anticipate the same support of those long-lived plasma cells that you see in older age groups. But maybe I, I can add to that on the... Yes than the delivery side. So I, I think there would be uh, a, a lot to gain f in terms of flexibility for programs if they could choose ages below nine. Um, but this would not necessarily be two years, uh, you know, or four years. Now, uh, why I'm saying that maybe, maybe two is something different, but I know uh, from colleagues working on other vaccines how challenges it is to get anyone beyond one year or two years in many programs. So that is a challenge in any case. So it's more about aligning with other vaccines. And one of the vaccines there is, you know, tetanus boosters at four or at start of schooling, typically, first in the beginning of school or in the in the early secondary school this and which is exactly what country is doing so the delivery question may not be completely dealt with the other thing and this reminds me of uh, um, you know male circumcision um, for HIV prevention uh, the easiest is to do um, male circumcision in in babies in, in young males this would prevent HIV in later life but you will have to wait 20 years before or let's say 15 years before that's going to have any effect so what's currently being done is that while they do promote uh, male circumcision in babies they also continue doing the male the the, the uh, male circumcisions in boys 10 to 14 why because they're close to sexual debut they will soon start to get the disease so this is exactly what we have with with uh, with elimination on the one hand we are calling for vaccinating as old as possible because the bigger your catch-up can be the quicker you will have an impact and so to move back almost two decades and start at zero uh, you know would put the whole progress uh, two decades back but combining that of course in the in the future would be a very interesting proposition if if that if that can be done so i think it's interesting to to remind ourselves of these two aspects i think also Thank you both. That I was going to say, I think this is a very changing situation. COVID, it seems to me, has um, been a, a game changer in many ways because um, adult vaccination, you know, total population vaccination has been accepted in all over the world. So now we have a slightly we have different structures and different opportunities for the adolescent older women older males vaccination that might benefit for HPV. So I, I, I think you always have to keep looking at a changing pattern of, of, um, of, of behavior worldwide. Thank you, Amy, would you like to add mm -hmm. anything? Yeah, I agree with that. And also just want to remind that, you know, as we consider either going younger, which I, increase, I agree increases flexibility, 
versus going older will get returns on that investment from going older sooner. Whereas with the B, you know, with the younger children, um, you know, we have to wait a long time to kind of see that return on investment. I do want to remind everyone though that there is a trial, a single dose trial in the Gambia that goes down to age four. So fortunately, those data will come in the next couple of years where we will know. And like Margaret said, you know, we think it'll be very um, it'll be a positive finding that single dose works down to the age of four. Thank you very much. Let me turn now to another participant uh, and invite uh, Helena Ervius to uh, uh, ask her question. Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for a very interesting discussion. Really, it's it's very with the with a very optimistic approach. Uh, my question, I don't know if it's provocative, but in the light of the the question you have now, uh, in a global perspective, uh, talking about cost effectiveness here, having a four valent vaccine and showing seeing your data. Could we use the four valent instead? Of course, we have to know that this will be produced and maybe it's always better to have more serotypes, but we're here presenting data with 16 and 18 and uh, most of the studies are pre non valent So could I please have your, some comments on that? Okay, I, I, I see Margaret uh, 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 puzzled perhaps. Uh, Amy, would you like to uh, start answering this question, giving your views? Um, sure. I actually have pretty strong views on this. So I do think in this moment now, whatever vaccine countries and people can get their hands on, that's the best to use. So I think that worrying about, you know, cross protection or extra types right now is, 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 um, is not, should not be our main message. Our main message is just get vaccinated with whatever vaccine you can get. And they're all great. I think as we accomplish those goals and we move from 13% uptake globally to much higher, I then think we can pivot and say, of course, covering a greater proportion of the types included in cervical, that cause cervical cancers is better. You know, especially if we think of cervical cancer elimination, we, you know, we, we can eliminate cervical cancers if we protect against more types. And that can either be through cross protection or through direct protection with a you know, vaccine that has multivalent. But I think that's secondary to the moment now. Right now we have a crisis at hand. We do not vaccinate enough of our girls in this world. So again, you know, we have vaccines right now, more vaccines are coming online that will need to generate one dose data. Use any of them, they're all great. Um, once we get that done, let's turn our attention to now those extra couple types. So I guess like, glass half full type thing, focus on preventing the bulk of cervical cancers today, worry about those extra percentage points tomorrow. Thank you, Amy. Margaret, would you like to add anything? I totally to agree with that. <clears throat> the, um, the prevention of cervical cancer, which has been shown already, but it's been shown in the young cohorts under 30. So there's no question that a 1618 vaccine gets rid of almost 90% of cervical cancers if you're under 30. And that's because you get 16 early. Therefore, <clears throat> it really wipes out the, uh, the cancers in the young. These other cancers come in older women. And in rich countries, you, you detect those by screening. Um, in poor countries, um, you'd want to get rid of 16, 18 first anyway, because it, it really does go for the bulk of women. And I, I think stop worrying about what the types are. Please just immunize. It, it really is critical to get as many women protected as possible or girls protected. And I think, you know, you should think of protecting the girl to protect the woman she becomes. Thank you. Thank you. Pa Paul, do you want to give us uh, your view, Sam? Uh... Okay, so let me move to the next. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. No, I, I just wanted to say it was very eloquently put. I mean, our 
it, it, this is indeed the message in our current position paper. You know, all vaccines protect very well, and the the, the emphasis should be on introducing and reaching high coverage. So I I think we have that, and I think you know we 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 are still in like the first generation of HPV vaccines. I think when we when you invite us again, and I'm sure you will do in in uh, 2032, we'll be in a different space, and 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 we'll so probably we. speak. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we'll we'll speak of a, a different different vaccines that will make this this discussion look uh, you know look dated of course so I, I think uh, yeah that's how we should thank you I, I will skip some questions from uh, Margaret and Heidi because I believe these questions have already been uh, been answered uh, by the the previous discussion about the the age uh, at which the vaccine should be the window should be administered or could be administered. Uh, let me turn to Beata Kampmann uh, now to ask her a question and make a comment. Thank you very much. This is really a, a terrific discussion. And I think to some degree, I, so I'm, uh, I work at the MRC unit in the Gambia, I lead the vaccine uh, research there. And the HANS trial is obviously a trial that we still really invested in. And I hope the data and the younger girls will be equally reassuring to what we've heard today. And to me, it's almost a question, you know, it's a rhetorical question. Do we still need more trials? When is evidence enough evidence? And, you know, in the line with what Amy and also Margaret have said, do we need to know, not move to policy to uh, reach the preventable diseases more quickly? And uh, I think this is maybe something that's already been uh, highlighted here, but to put it in the context of COVID, uh, and Margaret had alluded to COVID giving us an, a leg into a vaccine platform that goes beyond uh, the EPI program. Um, is there not an issue of equity here? And Amy, you, you also said, you know, we this, unacceptable that we are, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting to get these vaccines to the most prevalent uh, populations with, with cervical cancer. Um, and I think you, you have shared uh, probably similar views to what I would say. Um, what I, the question I have, which is, you know, moving more to the biology is really, um, what can we learn from the incredible immunogenicity of EPL constructs for other vaccines that we could construct? Because there are there are few vaccines which are better than nature, and clearly the HPV vaccine is better than nature. And what are the lessons that we can take from this, apart from you know all the equity issues and wanting to move with data, etc.? What would be your view on that, or what would you recommend? Thank you. Thank you, um, Margaret. Well, I, I mean the, the HPV VL, VLP is really remarkable, but it's it's really about the actual distancing of the um, epitopes on the surface. It's it that crystal structure. If you can if you can mimic a crystal structure, we know from work done back in the nineties and early two thousands that spacing between the epitopes is actually critical for generating high affinity neutralizing antibody. So in your antigen design, you, you, you ought to aim for a structure which does that. And I don't think that's, that idea is lost at all in vaccine, people who are designing new vaccines. It's just, um, deciding which vaccine you're going for, knowing enough about the biology of the virus and knowing enough about the protein chemistry. And I think it, for, for me, the um, uh, RSV um, potential is the one which tells you this is, you know, you once you know how that recept, how that protein is made, the various steps, and you know where to target, you know how to use protein chemistry to change it, then you're in with a viable vaccine. Then you know how to assemble your protein molecules. So I, uh, you're absolutely right. We we ought to use the VLP, which tells us how you can get them the very best response and why, and design. That, that way, and that's a message which I know vaccinologists have taken up. It's not it's not novel for me, but it 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 helps to understand the biology. Um, all too often, Thank it seems you. to me, jump, people jump into it without doing that. 
Thank you very much, Margaret. Amy, would you like to uh, comment on that and uh, give the NIH perspective if there are developments on that front? Um, so I was going to actually focus on another aspect that she brought up, which was the equity mm -hmm. issue. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone that, you know, we're, we are coming out of a supply shortage. And so when we were in that supply shortage, I think it was really important that we use public health measures to, to determine how to allocate existing doses. And to me, that public health measure is the number needed to vaccinate to prevent a cancer. And so when you think that way, all doses needed to go to young girls because you could, you know, if you had a hundred doses or a thousand or whatever number, you would absolutely maximize the impact of those doses with vaccinating young girls. Nothing else, you know, that would do it. But now that that supply shortage is, you know, releasing and we have more supply becoming available, this is now, I think, the great time to start to consider other populations. And so you asked if other studies were needed. I would say, yes, we need to understand um, immunobridging to boys. We need to understand how far up the age range in women and maybe men, one dose could work. We, we, we need to take it for a spin and see, you know, what other public health wins can we have with one dose HP vaccination? So I think it's time actually, you know, we have an early success right now. I think we can go much further with single dose and really kind of make some big differences. And with having adequate HPV vaccine supply, you know, I do think it's time to start thinking about these other populations. Um, and just one other comment on the equity issue. Um, if you vaccinate enough girls, if the uptake's high enough, you actually protect the majority of the boys too. Um, so it's an indirect protection through herd protection. Of course, we like direct protection and, and you, know, um, you know, men who have sex with men wouldn't benefit from the indirects often. So, you know, I think modeling will inform boys and girls, girls only, all of that. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move now to a question. Um, I mean, I see that that Dauda was uh, anxious actually to move fast with the expansion of the of the one door since uh, in economic terms, that seems to be really efficient. Um, but let, let's move to the question by Manish uh, Sadaragan Ghani. Manish? Yeah, thank, no, thanks for that. So I guess, I mean, we talked a little bit about the age already, so some of this is related to what you discussed before, but given the incredible um, interim results you showed from the trial in Kenya, which was in 15 to 20 year olds, um, albeit the seronegative one, so do we need to be thinking beyond just this age in terms of these reduced dose schedules now, as Margaret mentioned, the two dose, you know, used in Vancouver, where I am in Canada, is, is nine to 14 year olds only. And then when you get to your 15th birthday, magically, you suddenly need three doses. Um, so do we need to be thinking in a more nuanced way? Do we need to be thinking about the local epidemiology, the serial epidemiology, etc.? And, you know, along the lines of, as has been mentioned, the, the less restrictive you can make it, the higher coverage we're going, we're going to get. So really value people's thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, Margaret, Amy. Um, hi there, Manish. <laughs> Long time no see. <laughs> Manish was my student. Um, <laughs> I, so that's I why he's that, pushing I, you to the limit. Yeah, I know. He always did. Uh, <laughs> he was always the one who asked the rotten questions. Um, I don't know if it's serious. Age. It's, age is crucial. So all these terrific results with one dose, I think, you're, and certainly the terrific impact results, come if you go into the sexually naive. So targeting um, in places like Vancouver, 12-year-olds, in East Africa, eight to nine-year-olds, is absolutely the way to go. After that, Frankly, one dose is as good as two or three. I, it, it's, it's a nonsense to say you need three doses as soon as you hit 16. And it's a nonsense to say you need three doses because you've been exposed. Because you've been exposed, you've almost certainly got memory, which uh, you you know the vaccine will do a great job in, in banging right up. So I think it's, it, it's time to say this, three doses is overkill. 
Um, and one dose is as effective um, if you're 20, 30, or 40. But uh, yeah, but you you really to convince the um, the public health public, you'll have to have trials to show that. I, uh, I don't Margaret, it, it, so, sorry to interrupt, but uh, you, you said to convince public health, but it, it seems that you will need even more to convince the regulators. Or how oh, do yeah. you actually can make this data known and handled by the regulator? because there's still uh, a lot of reluctance and resistance to move to uh, alleviated uh, uh, schedules uh, to be licensed. Yeah. No, to, you're right. Whoever, the policy makers, those who are going to allow um, recommendations to go forward, um, regulators will have, they will demand trial data. So, if you're, if you're a manufacturer making a new vaccine, you'd better look at the landscape and have those trials in your back pocket when you come out and ask for um, licensure. You may go ahead. Um, I absolutely agree with Margaret. I think you know we want to stay focused on that primary target, and those are the young girls. But we have no data that says one dose won't work in basically most ages. You know, we don't have the data up in 30s and 40s, but certainly, I mean, the CVT was 18 to 25, Ken, she was 15 to 20. We, I can't point to something that says, oh, that suggests one dose doesn't work in the older people. But we need to get the primary younger girls vaccinated first before we can turn our attention away to these older ones. There's two issues I do want to bring up just to remind everyone. One, HPV vaccines are prophylactic in nature. So as you go up in age range and people have more prevalent infections, when you vaccinate these people and you look short term, those prevalent infections that are there at the time of vaccination, actually it won't clear any faster because of HPV vaccination and they look like a vaccine failure. So I do think this starts to muddy the evaluation of, the, of how any number of doses, but how one dose would work. So that's one point. The second point in considering how high up an age range to go is we do need to think of when are infections acquired that lead to cancer. And so we know that the bulk of these, I'm gonna call them causal HPV infections, these infections that cause cancers happen in the late teens, the twenties. You know, once you're into, you know, forties or fifties, these people acquiring new infections um, have a very probably lower likelihood of just, you know, because of competing mortality and other issues that they'll actually maybe go on to a cancer. So I do think there's a lot of public health opportunity once we deal with the nine to 14 year olds, the girls, to think about maybe 15 to 30. What can we do with single dose there to bring down HPV endemicity, to prevent those causal HPV infections, um, you know, to really, again, advance public health? Well, I think the key thing for when you start immunizing the older groups is your blocking transmission. And um, that, that's how most vaccines really exert their maximum effect, they block transmission. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a strong advocate of immunizing boys. I, I think you really need to get immunity across the population. And that means you immunize boys. And that brings a whole, you, you truly block transmission. I mean, the herd protection you get with a sexually transmitted infection is fantastic. But you, you do need to get both sides of the gender spectrum immunized. So no, I wouldn't go with zero status. I'd just uh, immunize everybody. It's a pandemic. That's, it's really interesting. HPV is a pandemic. Uh, people aren't sort of apparently falling dead in the streets, but it's a pandemic. In a pandemic, what do you do? You immunize everybody. Yeah, it, it's interesting actually in that uh, context to read the, the, the comment from the, the, the colleague from CIGB saying that uh, it's mandatory to increase the global coverage of vaccination for HPV. Um, and uh, that, that, that's a debate that we had all over the world with the, uh, with the COVID vaccine. 
Um, there seemed to be uh, a question uh, from uh, Iris Valdez Prado about the, the herd immunity. I think it has been uh, in implicitly already answered, but, but perhaps uh, Iris wants to push you a bit more. Iris? Iris? Iris Valdez, do you want to ask your question? Okay. You mute. Can you unmute? Please unmute. Okay, I'm go sorry. ahead. Uh, well, uh, well uh, I am from the uh, Walker in uh, from the CRGV. Uh, and I try to connect now by my phone. Sorry for the poor okay. connection. Okay, it's bad. So let me actually read your question. Uh, uh, since we're challenged by technology, you, you wanted some comment about the herd immunity for unvaccinated person and if they could be herd immunity in case of a one dose schedule. I think we've already heard from the discussion that there was a uh, uh, herd immunity that, that would likely be provided. But I guess the question is, would the herd immunity afforded by one dose be less than that afforded by uh, uh, a two or three dose schedule? So Emma, would you like to take that one on? Oh, I was hoping to hear from Margaret or Paul on that <laughs> one, but my, I would say no. One dose works the same, it prevents the same infections as two or three doses. So I think the herd immunity will look exactly the same. But I want to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, it Margaret? induces, I mean, it, one dose induces sterilizing immunity, um, full stop. And so uh, you don't have any virus to transmit. It's why I Thank went into to some detail on what persistent infection was, so that everybody knew what we were preventing. Thank you. Very brief and very, very strong uh, answer from both of you. Uh, there was also a quick... Uh, Paul? No? Um, there was also a question, uh, and I'm, I'm not clear on the question. Uh, 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 Adam uh, Dawood, would you like to verbalize your question? Please come on video. I'm puzzled by your question. Adam? Well, maybe he's disconnected, so... Oh, Adam, you're muted. Can you unmute and come on video? Okay, there was also uh, then uh, if Adam, if you uh, are back uh, later on, then then feel free to to wave us to to raise your hand. Uh, then let me move to uh, there was a question also or suggestion that perhaps we should consider the the one dose in males for the protection of warts. Um, I'm trying to look back at who was asking this um, this question. Uh, I, I believe uh, Jonathan uh, Crofts. Actually, you are looking at uh, non-cervical cancers, not, not warts. Jonathan? Okay, maybe he's, uh, he's disconnected, so... Um... Okay, Noni, would you like to comment? I see that, that you're coming up now with a comment. Hi, Margaret, lovely to see you. Um, I really wanted to raise the issue that we need to be quite aggressive in trying to move to younger kids because we do know that young girls who've been abused and including those who've been sexually abused, they have much earlier rates of sexual debut because of the circumstances that they come out of. They are much more likely to have many more sexual partners and have much higher risks of cervical cancer. So if we could get the vaccine down to four to five year olds, and make this generally acceptable for four to five year olds, as opposed to picking these girls out, the really young ones, I think it would be very helpful in high middle and low income countries. In high income countries, I know this has been very difficult. Um, uh, we, d 
these girls get lost to follow up. They run away from home. They end up on the street. There's a whole lot of things that happen to them at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old that puts them at enormous risk. And if we could help protect them earlier, it would be such a benefit. But we need more of that low young age data. And I agree, I think it's going to be fabulous data. It's going to show they're brilliant. Um, but we need to get that, get on with this. Comment? Well, I will comment on that because I totally agree with it. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, I get a lot of uh, questions from um, uh, legal authorities because of cases. And as a rule of thumb, I would say you should vaccinate every, every child who has been sexually abused because <clears throat> the risks of um, subsequent um, disease are significantly higher, but that's not a formal, that's an informal uh, arrangement. But you're quite right that um, that group is a recurring group and it, it will be dealt with in the long term because virus will be, the HPV 16 will disappear eventually, but you know, um, that'll be in a hundred years time. But if you if you brought the age down, even if it was to seven, you would have a dramatic effect. So it, there, are, there are good reasons for looking at the young. Um, one is to establish the safety and immunogenicity of the vaccine, which is why I'm, I'm one of the investigators on the HANS trials. So uh, one, of the, the, one of the reasons for doing those younger groups was that in Africa, the children don't necessarily know their age. So uh, that, you know, you might, be in immunizing a seven-year-old who's in a nine-year-old's class. But uh, as a, you do need to know that this vaccine is safe in this young age group, and then that there is a good reason to immunize that group if it's for pro quite pragmatic and programmatic reasons. Thank you, Margaret. I, I won't ask Emma to, to answer as well, but I will ask her to uh, read her uh, comment uh, or question to, uh, to Paul about the WHO press release and starting a debate on that uh, point. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we were very excited a week ago to see the press release from WHO with this new language about one or two doses could be applied to the young girls, to you know, the young adult women, even to boys. What information do we have about like which countries will take this and run? Will everyone now be using one dose? Will countries be hesitant and will say, well, oh, you said one or two, you know, will we feel more comfortable staying with two? Do we know or have like predictions about what's gonna happen over the next couple of years? How will this new recommendation, this new language be used? So, Amy, you were not my student, rather completely the other way around, but you do pose the rotten question, of course. <laughs> um, so we have no, we have really no idea. And, and if I can mention one percentage, I would say it, it's half a percent. I mean, the only country we know that is currently considering is England. Um, we do not have, of course, any formal indication first because this uh, advice uh, by SAGE came out two weeks ago. Um, um, we did we did talk to uh, in in the run up to this uh, with with program managers on a related question. We didn't ask about moving to one dose full stop, but we did ask managers in African countries, in Asian countries particularly those two settings and the lower income settings, but also some self self financing settings, which means middle income countries, not Gavi financed, whether they would be interested to using a one dose in the multi eight cohort, which was, as I explained, our originally, if you want, intended audience potentially for a permissive one dose. And I must say that uh, the reaction showed us that uh, at least half of these uh, program managers were very interested in this flexibility. Most of them were concerned with their NITAX. They were saying, I may consider, but only I would do that if my NITAX allows me to, which is 
a very good sign in a way, but also they were saying, and, and you know, if 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 WHO gives a clear indication that that the likelihood will increase, so if you uh, you know if if you ask me, I do think there is a group of countries that that will consider this. I think, and 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 maybe counter to what some people uh, may think, we may see surprises, and the fact that. England is considering this before many others, which is not known as a country that would, let's say, move because of financial problems uh, to, you know, choose for something that's cheaper, uh, you know, quite the opposite. Um, I, the, I think that that may indicate that, that this may move in different ways and it may be determined, for example, more by the strength of the NITAC and their their uh, you know ability to take uh, more difficult decisions. Um, so I think that's all I can say at, at this point. And thank you. It would be interesting, actually. I know it would be difficult to to collect this information, but it would be interesting to know from the immunization manager or the governments who intend actually to table that question to their NITAC, because of course. Um, I mean, they have to process the information and um, that would then lead to a change of, uh, of, uh, of schedule potentially. But I'm not sure at times that uh, if, if both parties are, are sitting there waiting, um, nothing may move. Do you care to comment on that? It's a rotten question as well. Yeah, so... Um... So yours is in a way not a question. It's a, it's a comment. It's an indication to say maybe do something. I think it it's it's interesting. It may go back to the to the the issue of consultation. So you you know you have worked a lot for Sage and on WHO position. So in, in that in that translation towards a position, there are steps we can take. And and you know as I said, we will be consulting with with different groups. Which will include NITAX because they will have, um, you know, they will have questions about how to read the data um, and, and, and other issues. So I think, um, you know, your uh, also your suggestion in a way to ask many NITAX is is kind of an interesting one uh, to to have a to have an idea of who who are considering this. But uh, I think this will be, um, you know, this will be something to look at. I mean, we you may remember we had guidance by uh, the SAGE working group and by SAGE about HPV in 2019 of long intervals between doses as a way of dealing with supply issues, as a way of dealing, um, you know, also with create greater flexibility. And um, two countries in the world have taken up this suggestion as far as we know at least to move to two or three years. Uh, many countries have actually moved from six months intervals to 12 months in the time since then, and that's a, a, a good move. Um, but to three years or five years, the only countries that have, have indicated and have actually taken steps to move are again England, who moved in a recent, uh, you know, the recent update to um, up to two years of interval, and Quebec, who has moved to a five-year interval uh, several months ago. And, and so, um, again, it, it goes back to Amy's question about who take this up, and that is not always um, many, uh, many night hacks, um, but therefore it, it, I think it becomes a very important question of how we stimulate that for definitely people to look at it. Thank you. There are two, uh, two more comments from uh, Beata Kempman and, uh, and Nani McDonald. And, and actually, for me, they're, they're somehow, in, in a way, uh, related uh, uh, because it's about giving the vaccine at a younger age and um, um, the asking about the, the four to six year old platform to, to help strengthen the, 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 the platform and give a catch up time as well. That's the comment from Noni and the other from, uh, from Beata is about the, the perception or, or the negative stigma of HPV, which is seen as, a, as a, a, um, you know, the, the, this um, uh, sexually transmitted disease and the stigma associated with the vaccination in some, uh, in some settings. So 
would that make the vaccine easier to, to accept? And, um, and I guess the question about the platform is more for you, Paul, uh, about how this would uh, uh, potentially strengthen the platform. So could we hear a bit of discussion on those points? Paul, do you want to get started? So, yeah, so on, on, on the platform, so the, the platform, of course, we, we, it's, it's early to say, I mean, here we can only, we can only guess. Um, I mean, if I think, you know, what some of our data shows that using schools has been the way to get high coverage. And so uh, I, I, th I mean, again, if it, it's a theory, I, I think we have very high coverages at at birth in the first year everything after the first year has the tendency to go down in terms of coverage when we see vaccines at two years of age measles challenging um, so i would think there could there would be a dip between two and four years of age it will be hard to get these children in these parents in these are new norms so um Practically, I would think that if we, you know, again, using the school as a platform, which in some countries may mean four, in most countries it would mean about six or seven years of age, could be a very interesting platform to start. Um, and, and again, of course, a school platform typically is primary school. Uh, and so it does cover all these ages. It, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 or 9. I think, you know, and there was a comment to the earlier questions, uh, many, many low-income countries really vaccinate at 9. Many high-income countries vaccinate at 12, 13. So they are the ones uh, who, you know, listening to Noni should really consider changing that. And I happen to see that, that the Netherlands, where I'm, I'm sitting today, actually just did that two months ago they changed from the age they had since start of the hpv vaccination i think 11 12 and they went down to nine uh, and so i think that there's scope there for countries to do but so staying in a in a school age may be may be really useful um and and to uh, provide uh, and and that's something also that the the, the sage had been discussing, you know, providing these multiple opportunities to get vaccinated. So, uh, and I, I'm not saying this is this is currently necessarily the case in places, but sometimes programs are set up to provide that one-time shot when you are in class five, which is great. But if you happen to be uh, well sick uh, on well on holidays, or you can think of multiple reasons not to be there that day. Um, well, you know, uh, that's your bad luck. It, it shouldn't be that way. And, and we should have multiple catch up opportunities. Maybe having your vaccine at six and having your, you know, another opportunity at 10 uh, is one way to go so that at least that you get multiple reminders to get to this high coverage before you really uh, engage in your, you know, sexual life. Of course, we have no idea of whether this really will let's say, change parents' perception of the vaccine when we now don't link it to a 9, 12, 11-year-old girl, but to a 8-year-old girl or boy. I mean, it remains a vaccine against HPV. So um, it, it, it's too soon to say, but it could be a, a working hypothesis that it, it may change uh, and it, it increases acceptance. But I think in general, uh, the, the starting point should be that HPV is very well accepted. And in many countries, and we've seen that in the, in the demonstration programs where we had sufficient, if you want, time and dedication to, let's say, smaller scale projects. Most programs in African and Asian setting reached coverages over 90%. This was no issue. So the vaccine is extremely well accepted. It becomes different when you suddenly say, well, come to the facility and get it when you want. Suddenly then everything drops to very low levels. Uh, so, um, you know, we shouldn't equate low coverage with low acceptance definitely not the case, uh, nor with very active hesitancy uh, either. And yes, that is the case in places, but it's not necessarily the driving force. Um, so I think this is an area where we need more 
implementation research, operational research. That's one of the pleas that, that SAGE also had, that this whole issue of why we have lower co coverage should be looked at. And, and one of the issues that we are actually starting to work on at WHO is to look at the behavioral side and to understand better what our clients think, uh, you know, which are both parents and the children but particularly the parents of this vaccine and to gear and, and the, the programs towards those needs and, and wants so that we get the highest levels of uptake yeah thank you uh, thank you very much um, uh, it seems that Jonathan Cross is now back online so Jonathan very briefly can you make your point and come on video if you can and then after your comment and the answer from the panelists I will actually close this um, this session so Jonathan um, yeah no it was just I mean I've been seeing some of the responses we've been getting from stakeholders <clears throat> about one dose and a lot of them are the groups who lobbied us about vaccinating boys. And they're coming from the perspective of, you know, that it's too much of a risk to take at this point. Um, and they, and I think also the manufacturer, raise the issue about boys, about not being any evidence in boys and um, sort of the non cervical cancers, the head and neck cancers etc so i'm just you know i know we're a lot of us are pretty much converted to one dose but these are these are sort of the, the feedback we're getting from from the sort of the stakeholders that's all i know that who did discuss boys um obviously the focus globally is girls um you know uk hs uk is a, a sort of uh, uh industrialized country and boys is 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 are vaccinated but the focus globally is girls but i'm just saying this is one uh issue that's being raised that's all thanks if anyone Thank you. Can comment. anybody would like to add anything i mean i think it's a to some extent a self-standing comment it's a, a it means a bizarre situation because the immunobridging studies that were done for for, for two doses in boys showed that with two doses you got more antibody in boys so the ages in adolescent boys than you did in adolescent girls so there is there is no it, it's an illogical position but that's never stopped anybody with with deeply opposing views from pushing their uh, boat out i think all i think one can only say that that boys make a better immune response than girls and that uh, there are no formal trials, but that the immunobridging trials for two versus three um, can be um, used for one versus two. And really, this is: do you want one? Do you want immunity, or do you want no immunity? Because they have to remember that men make very poor immune responses and are not protected by the antibody they generate. And that is in natural infections. So unless you immunize the boys, you don't protect them. Thank you, Margaret. Let me uh, bring this, uh, this webinar time is running and we are close to the uh, to 5 p.m. CET. So let me bring this, uh, this session to a close. I, I, I really want to thank our speaker, Margaret, very much for a fabulous presentation. I want to thank our discussants. I mean, really, you were extremely knowledgeable and passionate, and it's uh, it's nice to see passion out there. You communicate your your passion, and thanks to all the participants for the uh, the good questions and and comments that were that were raised. So thank you very much for that. I want to make an announcement. That's about our next webinar. Actually, we are going to start resuming face to face alumni meetings. Our next meeting will be a hybrid meeting, virtual and face-to-face -face in ESPID. Actually, we will have two sites, one in ESPID and uh, in Athens and one in uh, Les Pensières for those who will be in Les Pensières and then others will connect virtually. And the topic will be on the impact of COVID on pneumococcal disease in children. 
And the speaker will be Ron Dagen, so you can uh, anticipate some uh, uh, stimulating uh, uh, discussion following the, uh, the talk. So I hope that uh, many of you will be interested and uh, we will circulate the announcement uh, uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So thank you so much to everybody and uh, have a good day or good evening or good night wherever you are in the world. So thank you so much. And uh, we will pause with the permission of the discussants and the, and the speaker. We will pause the recording on the alumni website, but we will go one step further and give it free access also so that others interested, like NITAG uh, 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 members and uh, also alumni from other courses who would be interested uh, could access the, uh, the recording and, uh, and your presentation, Margaret. So thank you, everybody, once again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, and thank you, Philippe.